Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. So now we're beginning the Mahatmya Khandam of the Tripura Rahasya. We began in the last series with the Jnana Khanda, the introduction anyway. But before we got too far into it, I wanted to go back and see what was the backstory. And so I ordered the Mahatmya Khanda. And when I took a look at it, I realized, wow, this thing doesn't make any sense without the Mahatmya Khanda. Or it would give a distorted understanding of what Advaita is all about. So we're going to go back and go through the Mahatmya Khanda, beginning with the invocation. Now, as usual in Sanskrit work, the author tries to put the gist of the entire work in the invocation so that when one starts reading, studying, or teaching this work, the invocation is read as a way of setting the mood, setting the context, which gives the correct meaning. So let's take a look at this invocation in detail. First of all, of course, it begins with Aum, as any genuine Vedic work always will. Aum is the seed, the Bija, the Bija mantra from which everything else comes. The first and last words of the Veda are Aum. And as we went over a couple of days ago, it's not Aum. <laughs> In fact, I have a hard time even doing, it's pronounce, mispronouncing it properly. <laughs> Aum. And then a moment of silence. Aum. It's very interesting, you know, as far as commercial or publicly available works, the only one I've ever heard or come across that pronounces Aum properly is an old song by the Moody Blues. Remember? Aum, Aum, heaven. Even uses the correct melody, uh, or at least for, for during the daytime. So uh, I was very impressed by that. But since then, everybody has seemingly uh, forgotten. Aung. And of course, we went deep into the meaning of Aung in our series on Gayatri, which is a bit dated. <laughs> My current understanding is like light years beyond where it was two years ago when I made that series. But it's a good introduction. So the next word is Shri. A Shri refers to Lakshmi. Lakshmi is the goddess of fortune, the goddess of wealth. So that means there's wealth here, there's value here. Maybe not the kind of wealth that you can take down to the bank, which probably isn't a good idea anyway. <laughs> but uh, the kind of wealth that cannot be lost. Even banks can fail, even governments can fail. Currencies have failed many times. But real knowledge can never fail. It can never be taken away. And once realized, it stays with you even into the next life. So my astrologer told me, I described to him the conditions of my early life and so on. And he said, yes, you got so much knowledge from your previous lifetimes. And it came to you like without any effort because you already earned it. You already deserve it. And so it manifested from within your heart. This is called Chaitya Guru, the Guru in the heart. So in this way, a fortunate person will have so many uh, items of knowledge and wisdom 
that manifest spontaneously. That still doesn't excuse you from ha having to do the work to make further progress. <laughs> anyway, the next word is Ganesha. Sri Ganesha. The purpose of making obeisances to Sri Ganesha is to ward off obstacles. He is always the first God worshipped in any authentic Vedic ceremony. Why? To remove any obstacles, to clear our intelligence. Huh? You'll find if you're studying and you're having a hard time with something, huh? just repeat the 16 names of Ganesh. Uh, we have them on our private channel. I don't think anybody's even read it, but anyway. <laughs> the 16 names of Ganesh. Just repeat, it's two shlokas, you know, it takes 30 seconds. And if you do this and then meditate on Ganapati, on his form, huh? his handsome elephant face and so on, and you'll find <laughs> miraculously things will clear up and you'll be able to understand in a very simple way things that are extremely erudite or difficult, esoteric even. So then the next word is Sharada. Sharada is a name of Saraswati. Saraswati is the goddess of learning. She's another portion of Tripura. Huh? Lakshmi is one portion and Saraswati is the other main portion. And from these three goddesses, all these worlds have descended. So Saraswati gives learning, not ordinary superficial learning in the form of verbal uh, memorization. Huh? Especially in India, schools don't really teach understanding. I've had many people in the IT business tell me that Indian programmers right out of school are basically useless. Why? Because they're not given any practical instruction, only theory, and they have to memorize things. So, of course, that's not going to give any real practical knowledge. Real knowledge means the ability to do, the ability to create something. Saraswati gives deep knowledge, the knowledge that allows you to duplicate and apply whatever you learn. And we go over this, <laughs> practically speaking, in our series on matrix learning. And the reason we, we uh, approach Saraswati is for obtaining a clear understanding of the word and its meaning which is exactly what matrix learning is all about. So you should check out that series. It'll make the difficulties of this series a lot easier to cope with. And finally, we offer respects to the Guru, Guru Bhyo. Here we go again. <laughs> From the very first shloka, we cannot escape the Guru principle. Guru simply means there's somebody who knows something that I don't and can teach it to me, can show me how to apply it, especially. In authentic Vedic education, they start by reciting the mantras until the mantras become completely habit, huh? burned into the circuits in the brain. <laughs> Then they go into the meaning. And of course, this opens up a whole new dimension. So guru is necessary. Why? To check you. What do you think this means? And you give some answer. And if it's right, the guru can say, yes, you got it. If it's not, he can correct you. Without this, you can spend years. I'll tell you from my own experience. In the beginning, I didn't have a private teacher for music. I began studying uh, flute in the school. And I developed so many bad habits, you know, because we had a big class 
I don't know, seven or eight students in the class, a lot of them went uncorrected for a long time. Then, even though somehow or other I became skillful, when I went to the conservatory, my first session with a real teacher was like, oh my God, you have so many bad habits. And it took me more than a year. I had to go back to the very beginning, huh? one note at a time. Oh, it was humiliating. <laughs> because I didn't have a teacher, I could develop so many wrong habits and never know it. Because somehow or other, I could play things. I just wasn't playing them right. And so I was easily becoming fatigued and so on and so forth. So you must have guru. And especially for spiritual things, you must have initiation, diksha. Initiation is very important because it links you with the parampara, the disciplic lineage coming from the original teachers of the line. For example, this work, the Devi Mahatmya, goes all the way back to Parashuram. And then it was written down by somebody else and so on. And we'll get to that whole story. But we have to be in disciplic succession. And his modern representative, of course, was Shankaracharya about 1500 years ago. That's modern in Vedic terminology. So we are in his line and we follow his standards. We've taken initiation, diksha. So why do we approach Guru? To understand the secrets. So the complete invocation is Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha I incessantly prostrate with joy to Sri Ganesha to ward off obstacles, to Saraswati for obtaining a clear understanding of the word and its meaning, and to the Guru to understand the secrets. Now, I know <laughs> gurus are so terribly out of fashion these days. Nobody wants to take a guru. Nobody wants to submit to the authority of anybody, especially somebody who is going to tell you how to think, huh? how to understand things. But don't we have to do this anyway? Even to get a job. Say you want to get a job as a, a taxi driver. You have to pass a test that shows you know the traffic laws, especially the ones that apply to taxis, and the streets of the city where you're going to be driving. In London, it's a big deal because London's very complicated, very big. It's called the knowledge. And it can take two or three years before someone's able to pass that test. So what does he do? He goes to a guru. He goes to a tutor. And he gets help. Huh? So guru is necessary even for mundane knowledge. What to speak of transcendental knowledge? Transcendental knowledge is far, far beyond uh, any kind of technical knowledge. Huh? Even so-called artificial intelligence. I think the people that work on computers are sometimes artificially intelligent. Huh? Scientists in general... They tend to create things because they can and not think at all about whether they should or whether this invention will be good for people. Uh, and I've made the example many times of DDT. And now many agricultural chemicals are showing up in our food, in our bodies, in mother's milk, in fetuses. And nobody really knows the long-term effects of these chemicals. Really, it's a good idea to go back to organic farming <laughs> and stop killing cows. If we stopped killing cows and eating meat, the uh, need for farmland would decrease by 75%. In other words, we could feed the whole world on merely a quarter of the existing farmland now. The rest of it could go back to forests and save the climate. 
So you see, the Vedic injunctions, the Vedic laws, the rules and regulations, the instructions of the guru are really very practical, especially in the long run. They're proven. They're thousands of years old. It's not new technology. It's the oldest technology because the very purpose of this universe is for the different creatures in it to attain self-realization. Someone once asked Ramana Maharshi, oh, don't we care about the world? Don't we want to help the world, you know, the poor people and to stop the fighting and so on and so forth? And Ramana said, the greatest welfare you can do for the whole world is to attain self-realization yourself. And for a long time, I considered that. I didn't really understand it until I read an explanation by uh, Chandra Shekharendra, one of my other gurus. And he said, the whole purpose of the existence, somebody had asked this question, what is the purpose of existence? And he said, the whole purpose of existence is to ask this question and to meditate until you get the answer. So this is the real question. This is the real knowledge. What is the purpose of this universe? Why did it come into being? For self-realization. And so the actual purpose, when we serve it, benefits the whole world. And if we ignore it or delay it, or try to weasel out of it. <laughs> we only create trouble for ourselves because we're going against the purpose of God, the purpose of the Creator, the purpose of all natural laws. So make things easy on yourself. Take up this path of self-realization. And we're going to show in the succeeding episodes how this path is not only easy, and natural. It's also superior to all other paths because it doesn't demand you to force yourself to be something that you're not. In fact, the opposite. <laughs> it helps you discover what and who you really are. Aung Tatsat. Aung Harihi Aung.